Hey guys, welcome back to part 22 of the Kotlin tutorial. There's still a lot more to learn about functions, but we already have the basics covered. We will come back to more advanced function features later. But for now, we will learn about classes, which are another very important programming concept, because classes help us get more structure into our program as it grows. A class is a definition of a data type. Remember, at the end of part 5, when we learned about the basic data types, I said that we will learn how to create our own data types later. And the way we do this is by creating classes. The inbuilt data types we have used so far, like int or string or array, are also defined by their own classes. We've already seen some of these classes in the primitives kt file, because our number types also have classes. The string data type, for example, is declared by this string class inside the string.kt file, which also belongs to Kotlin's standard library, just like primitives kt. Now, as I already said before, these basic data types in Kotlin get some special treatment by the compiler. That's why these classes look so small and incomplete. Kotlin string actually uses Java's string class under the hood when we target the JVM. And this is also where the actual character sequence of the string is stored. But without getting too much into the details here, the only thing that matters here is that each type in Kotlin has such a class definition somewhere. Now, besides things like the length value of a string, these simple types basically only store a single value we work with. So a variable of type string contains the text we put in there. A variable of type int contains a single number. But the data types we build later contain a combination of these existing types to represent something more complex. And we do this by putting different types of variables into the same class. For example, we could create a user type that contains a string for a username and an int value for his age. Or we could create an address class that contains multiple strings and numbers for the different parts of the address. And the user class on the other hand could then contain such an address as one of its pieces of data. So we can put these types into each other to create more complex data structures. And a variable inside the class could also represent a certain state our user is in. For example, it could have a boolean that indicates if the user is locked in or not. Or we could have something that describes his member status. Besides data, a class can have certain capabilities, or things it can do. Those are the functions that are placed inside the class. And they often operate on the class's data in some way. Those are the functions that we call in so-called dot notation by adding a dot behind a variable. Now the basic types only have simple functions, like this one that returns a subsequence of characters for this string, or the operator functions that we can call in dot notation instead of using the operator signs, or the number conversion functions like too long or too int that we saw in part 5. But more complex data types can do more sophisticated stuff. For example, a user class could have a login function that matches a text input against his password and then changes the locked in state of the user. Now in a real program, you would probably have another class that handles the login validation, but for simplicity, we will ignore some design principles for now. Or we could have a bank account class that stores the amount of money as a number and then has deposit and withdrawal functions to operate on this value. But a class is just the definition of a data type. The actual pieces of data that we create from this class and then assign to variables to work with them are called objects. So the string class defines that the string contains a sequence of characters and that it can do certain things like return a single character or a subsequence or append another string. But the different strings that we create in our code that contain the text we defined are the actual objects. Similarly, a user class would describe that each user should have a name and an age and any other necessary data, but each individual user object then has their own name and age values. So we could have a user Hans who is 30 years old and a user Elfriede who is 60. The types of variables it contains and the code within the functions stay the same for each object of a class. Only the values in these variables, which the functions then operate on, are different. So when we lock in Hans, it doesn't also automatically lock in Elfriede. Similarly, when we return the character at index 1 for the string hello, we get an E. When we do the same for the string by, we get a Y because these functions operate on different objects. Now a class only has to be declared once, and then we can create as many objects of this new type as we want. This is why a class is often compared to a blueprint or a construction plan in the real world. For example, the construction plan for a car is not the car itself, but only an idea. And we can create as many cars from the same construction plan as we want. 
Each car made from this construction plan has the same structure and the same components it's made up of, like a chassis, four tires and paint in a certain color. Some of these components are made up of smaller components like the engine or the gearbox. And each car can do the same things like accelerating, braking or switching gears. But each car object created from this construction plan has its own parts and its own state it's currently in. So each car has its own color, its own set of tires with different mileage. Also, for example, a different gear put in. And each car is currently placed at a different location in the world and has a different speed it's moving at. So the construction plan is not the car itself, it's just the idea of the car. Similarly, a class is just the idea for an object. But if we need a completely different vehicle, like let's say a helicopter, we need a completely different construction plan. Because the helicopter doesn't have four tires, but it has water plates. And the construction plan of a car doesn't describe this. Similarly, while objects of the same data type can contain different values, for example a different int and a different string, if we need a completely different combination of variables, like let's say a two ints and a boolean, we need a different class. Okay, but what's the benefit of creating these data types, as opposed to just using the basic types and normal functions like we did so far? Up until now our code was very simple. We declared a few variables and did some simple operations. We separated our logic into functions, which we gave descriptive names, and this already helped giving our program some structure. But this is not enough for a large, complex program. We would still have difficulties maintaining it as it grows. Earlier or later we would lose track which functions are making changes to which variables, or which variables belong together logically. And by bundling variables and functions that belong together into objects, we can divide a complex problem, which a program is, into smaller, more self-contained parts. And each object then represents a different part of the program. And each has its own data and logic, and can communicate with other objects through their functions. So a user object represents what a user is and what it can do. And a bank account object contains the logic for a bank account. And each user object could then have their own bank account object, and call certain functions on it to interact with it. Or user objects could interact with each other, for example to add each other to a friend list. Of course we could also realize all of this with only top level functions and variables, but this would be harder to maintain and would make it more likely that we accidentally introduce bugs. Bug is by the way the term for a flaw in a computer program that makes it misbehave, but objects make our code more understandable and more reusable, not only in the same program but also in other programs. And this whole concept is called Object Oriented Programming or short OOP, which is a so called programming paradigm. A programming paradigm is a style of programming, a way of mapping a problem to a software solution. Because as humans we need some way to handle the complexity that a big program brings. The computer doesn't need it, it only needs a sequence of instructions, but we do. Especially when we are working with code written by someone else. And objects are so helpful because they match the real world so closely, since we really interact with objects all the time. Cars, bicycles, your TV, your cell phone, a calculator, but also for example people or animals can be seen as objects. Because they are an encapsulated entity with certain characteristics and a certain state, like a color, a weight, an age, a selected channel or a mood. And they have certain things they can do or behavior, like talking, driving, calculating something, turning it on or off. Similarly to how objects created from classes have data and functions. And these real-world objects often vary in complexity, just like classes can contain only a few values and do simple things or be more complex. And they are often made up of smaller parts, which each could then be thought of as an object itself, and which then interacts with other objects within the part. Also, if a part breaks, you can often replace it. Not so much for humans and animals, but for things. Similarly, you can replace modular objects and programs, if they don't work as intended, as long as the new object does the same job. Now objects and programs are usually a bit more abstract than objects in the physical world, but in most cases it's still quite understandable what they represent, even if the class wasn't written by you. For example, when you see the Android class Notification Manager, you know that it's responsible for managing notifications in some way, although a Notification Manager is not a real-world object. And things like button, image, date or media player are pretty self-explaining. Object-oriented programming is very popular, but there are other programming paradigms which try to handle the complexity with different strategies. For example, functional programming, where we go a different route and separate functions and state more strictly instead of bundling them into objects. And many languages can be used with different paradigms. 
Some enforce a certain paradigm more strictly than others in their syntax. For example, in Java, all code goes into classes, even the main function. We don't have top-level declarations like in Kotlin. But Java is still not a pure object-oriented language, because it allows some things that are strictly speaking not object-oriented. Kotlin supports both object-oriented and functional constructs, but for now we will focus on OOP, because it's more widely spread at the moment. And we will take a look at functional programming features later. The benefits of object-oriented design go beyond just bundling data and functions into a logical unit. We will learn about these benefits along the way while we are building our classes, which we will start with in the next part. And we will also learn about the four pillars of object-oriented programming, which are encapsulation, abstraction, inheritance and polymorphism. And your homework for this video is to look around you, take one object, this can also be yourself or your pet, and then describe in the comments below what characteristics or attributes this object has, what states it can be in, and what things it can do, or what actions it can perform. Please leave a like if this video was helpful, and then we see us in the next part. Take care.